Good morning, everybody. I'm Judy Stevenson. I'm the Montgomery County Small Business Navigator. And on behalf of County Executive Mark Elritz and Assistant Chief Administrative Officer Jerome Fletcher, um, I'm pleased to welcome you to this edition of our uh, Economic Revitalization and Recovery Town Hall. As you know, we hold these town halls every other week to allow the business community to connect directly with um, our leadership and get updates on the COVID-19 pandemic response and uh, vaccine, roll vaccine rollout. Um, today we're going to have uh, interpretation available simultaneously during the uh, webinar. So I'm going to turn the um, screen over right now to Mario Panamino, who's going to provide some instructions for how to access and utilize the um, interpretation. If you will, if you want to hear Mario's presentation, please click on the globe that's in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and you'll be able to hear uh, Mario's instructions. Go ahead, Mario. Okay, thank you, Mario. So, so um, I'm going to be providing uh, some updates on our grant programs, and we will also have uh, Dr. Earl Stoddard and Dr. Travis Scales and Sylvia King from our county attorney's office provide updates. And then toward the end of the program, we're going to uh, welcome a um, we're going to welcome a an expert panel. Uh, that's going to discuss the topic of uh, the impact of the pandemic on women uh, in the workforce. So uh, also I wanted to mention that make sure everybody knows that um, the uh, session is being recorded. It will be posted probably in about a week on the Montgomery County Business Portal. So if you have colleagues or people in your network that you think might be interested in this topic, um, please be sure to let them know that that recording is available. You're welcome to put questions in the Q&A chat, and um, we will deal with those probably toward the end of each of the segments of the of the town hall. Uh, so please feel free to uh, put those questions in for either our expert panel or for our county leadership team. So uh, for grants, um, for those of you who received the Public Health Emergency Grant, which was one of the um, early grants that the county uh, made available to the business community, um, it is time for you to submit your um, annual report. If you have not done so, please look for an email that went out a couple weeks ago from Montgomery County government asking that you complete that report. Uh, Reopen Montgomery, that was the second major business um, grant program that the county offered. Uh, that program is all but wrapped up. We have a few um, grants that are still outstanding in the payment processing piece, but we will be wrapping that up by the end of this month. Uh, the hotel relief grant program, there were 26 uh, hotels and other accommodation establishments that were eligible for phase three funding. So um, those uh, payments are being made now and most of them are complete. Uh, we also the, are partners at the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation are um, finishing up with phase three of the restaurant relief program. There were 57 applicants that had been approved in uh, round two, but the funding ran out, so they didn't get funded. Uh, those 57 will receive their grants in phase three. There were 37 additional new applications received for the restaurant relief program, and those uh, also will get the full 10,000 funding through that program. And then there was a group of businesses um, that were approved for phase one and phase two that will also receive additional funding. Um, the amount of the, the funding available will limit the number of those to about 530. And so there will be a lottery of all of those grant recipients to determine who gets the funding. Uh, the Economic Development Corporation is going to be administering a nonprofit program that will be announced on June 14th. This is a targeted program. 
and the application window will be July 6th through the July 16th, so keep an eye out for that from the Economic Development Corporation. Um, so I just wanted to mention to everybody that um, the SBA has um, indicated that they might get additional funding for the Restaurant Revitalization Program, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, I always encourage people uh, follow your Chambers of Commerce. They are really a great source of information on uh, these programs and, of course, ongoing programs as well. So that's a good source of information for you to take advantage of. Uh, so at this point, I would like to um, turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Gales to provide an update on um, our COVID response and, and what the current situation is. Uh, Dr. Gales, please take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you, Judy, for the introduction. Uh, happy to be here with you all. Happy to take any questions. I am very happy to report that there is not much to report, actually, uh, in terms of the things that we have talked about consistently through the pandemic. We've talked about community transmission levels. Right now, our case rate is at or below one in terms of the daily average. Our test positivity is at 0.4%. Uh, and we are seeing anywhere from 5 to 12 to 13 cases a day. Uh, this is all in the setting of certainly we're still concerned about variant strains as they move through our community, and we've seen how they have increased in other parts of the world. Uh, but it's all done in the setting of increased vaccination rates. Uh, earlier this week, in fact, our county was, based upon looking at the numbers, was the number one ranked county in the country Wow. With populations over 300,000 uh, for a uh, percent of residents vaccinated, uh, particularly within the 12 to 17 year old age group. Uh, we're approaching, I believe we are over 70% of our residents having received at least one dose. You, some, you may be familiar with that number as the president has put that out for a national benchmark. And we are continuing to increase the percentage of our residents who are fully vaccinated. So when we look at the bigger picture, uh, we certainly want to continue to increase the percentage of folks recovered. We don't want to stop and say we're done and fold up and, and, and close shop. Uh, we are going to scale back some of our operations and continue to support our community partners in the testing and vaccine space because we do recognize that there's still pockets within our community that have had challenges getting the vaccine. And so we want to make sure that that is not an issue for any of our residents. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be uh, using the data even more closely uh, to be able to tailor those vaccine opportunities to make sure that we're not missing any folks. Now, we're obviously going to be go through a, a little bit of a transition period as everyone kind of looks and says, okay, we're in a new world again. This We haven't seen this space since February of last year, realistically, in terms of moving about throughout the community. So in that setting, you're going to see some folks wearing face coverings. You're going to see some not, and that's okay, uh, because we know that uh, even for those who are fully vaccinated, there's still an adjustment period, given what we've asked you to do over the last year and some change. Uh, so please be patient with us. Be patient with businesses as they also move through, and you all know, uh, there's some there's an adjustment period there and I want to emphasize is that even though the general policies have changed where there's no capacity limits there's no set requirements for face covering we still do strongly encourage folks to monitor good behavior to wear face coverings if you're not vaccinated uh, and businesses do have the opportunity to implement what they feel comfortable in terms of the expectations of their their clients um, and those who utilize their services. I want to say a special thank you to you all recognizing that everything that we have asked you to do from a public health perspective has had unintended consequences that have impacted your bottom line and impacted your ability to do work. So we don't move forward and say yay and celebrate everything. Yes, we're happy the numbers are where they are and that things are reopening, but we do recognize and acknowledge that this has had a real impact in a number of different ways. And hopeful, at least those of us in the public health field that I can speak for, we are cheering you on and hoping that policymakers advance the types of policies that will revitalize your industries and provide you with the necessary support that you need to be fruitful and continue to provide us with the goods and services that you all have done throughout uh, history. I will stop there. Happy to answer any questions uh, that you all may have. Thank you. 
Dr. Gales, we have one question. Um, can you share equity data for youth vaccinations by race, race, ethnicity, and age combined? So we do actually publish, a, I can't share it right now, I don't have it in front of me in terms of that, but we do have a host of that data that we have made available on our public facing websites uh, in terms of that uh, as best as we can to the level of specificity that we can. Uh, and so we don't have the ability to you know, answer individual inquiries within that, but we've tried to make sure that that data is uh, as to the level of specificity that we have is available to the general public. But certainly if there are any follow-up questions related to that, please let us know and we'll be happy to address them. Okay, thank you. Dr. Stoddard, do you have anything you wanted to add to what Dr. Gales provided? Yeah, just a couple of things um, to talk about what the county reopening or reconstitution, I should say, because many of our functions were still open. Uh, we are moving forward with, I think, eight additional libraries opening next week. Uh, rec centers and senior centers are opening. Uh, alcohol beverage service hour, store hours are expanded on Sundays. I think most relevant for the business community, uh, permitting services beginning in-person hours on Monday, the 14th. And so, obviously, if you need plan reviews or other things like that, they will be able to do those in person beginning on Monday as well. We also know that our housing and community affairs inspectors will begin to go into homes and other venues uh, beginning next week as well. Um, at, we are right now with one of the big focuses of the county is we're trying to balance out and figure out what the what the real, the new set point, as it were, of online versus in person services. We, we, we're bringing things back in, but we've recognized that we've made so many advancements that the, that the public and the business community has found very helpful in utilizing online services. And so we're trying to encourage still doing those things that the business community has wanted with offering in-person opportunities for those people who prefer that methodology. And so we're, we're going through the learning process of figuring out exactly what that balance will be moving forward. Um, as Dr. Gales alluded to, we did uh, rescind the requirement that you wear face coverings in most county facilities. I would still remind you that in our correctional facilities, healthcare facilities, uh, summer camps, and there's a fourth that I'm now forgetting. Transportation. Transportation, you're still required to wear face coverings. Um, and so uh, just as we ask that people respect the business community and, and their decisions that they make and individualized, we ask that the public and the businesses respect those specific venues where it's still required. Some of those are state mandates, some of those are federal mandates, and some of those are county mandates, just for just for clarity. So I think that's all I have today. One thing I did want to mention, Earl, on top of that is that reminder to everybody that the previous regulatory environment before COVID still exists. So whatever was in place that you had to do to either get licenses or permits or, you know, any kind of regulations that you needed to follow as a business, those all still exist. So please refresh your memories about, um, you know, what the regulatory environment is and uh, let's get back to normal with that. Do you want to add anything to that, Earl? No, I was just, as you well know, since you pulled together many of those resources, we've actually, some of the portals that we've had on our website have been taken down and they now redirect to the existing pre-COVID right. requirements, permitting requirements, all those things, because as you know, they're still in place. We wanna make sure we remind people that, uh, you know, just because there are no COVID restrictions does not mean that there are no regulations. Right. So I wanted to mention that Sylvia put a link in the chat to the vaccination dashboard. Um, so that's there. Um, and also, I just wanted to take a moment to thank um, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, and Sylvia for all of your hard work over the last 14, 15 months. I know it's been just tremendously stressful and, and difficult, and you guys have done a, just a wonderful job. And, you know, there's some um, notes in the chat. I hope you see, um, you know, positive about the great news and the great job that you all have done. So thank you for everything you've done, and thank you for being willing to be in these uh, every other week meetings just so that the business community has direct connection with those of you who know the most about what's going on. So thank you all so much. All right, so I think um, at this point, we're going to uh, transition to our panel. Uh, where the discussion is the pandemic fallout and it's how to address the alarming reduction in the number of women in the US workforce post COVID. So I think we all know that, um, and we've heard nationally that this pandemic has had a tremendous impact on working women. So today we have a panel of 
knowledgeable and valuable experts who are going to join us to discuss this topic. Uh, Lynn uh, Stein-Benzian, who is with our Economic Development Corporation, is going to give us some statistics and data so that we understand what the situation is. Jennifer Arnais, who is the manager of the Early Childhood Services with the Montgomery County Child Care Resource and Referral Center, is going to talk about some child care um, data that might help people understand what's available and, you know, how child care has been delivered and will continue to be delivered in a safe way. Uh, Morgan Worthingham, I'm sorry, Morgan Wortham, I don't know why I keep doing that, uh, is the Managing Director of the Maryland uh, Women's Business Center located in Rockville, and she's going to talk about some strategies for businesses to help women uh, reintegrate into the workforce. And then Christine Christina Maud, who is the first vice president of the Montgomery County Commission for Women, is going to talk about some strategies for um, women actually looking to re-enter the workforce. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to you first, and hopefully you can share what the data is telling us about this issue for women. Thank you so much, Judy, and thank all of you for being here today to discuss this really important issue. Um, I want to start by acknowledging Brandon Bedford. He's our genius research and policy manager at Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. He pulls all the numbers for us and then helps us understand what they mean. So. Uh, Really, a lot of this came from him. I also want to acknowledge Ellen Cornelius, who is uh, working working with the county. She is hel helping us with our technology today and running the slides for us. Thank you, Ellen. So the numbers in this presentation are national. Local numbers lag, and we will not know them for months. But we can extrapolate the scope of the problem here in Montgomery County by looking at the national trends. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. Um, so, um, Somebody could, could nod. I can't see the slides on my my screen. Can somebody nod? Are they there? Oh, I'm going to give Ellen a chance to. Yes, sorry. One second. Okay. Computer is very slow. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I just launched. In the meantime, Mario, we've actually had a request wondering if you could turn your uh, video off. Ellen, could he? Could that be the standard? There we go. Got it. Thank you. I'll just give Ellen another minute. Ah. Ah, there we go. We're getting there. Technology is wonderful, as we've all learned in the past 15 months, and it's even more wonderful when it responds to us instantaneously, which is almost never. So, if nothing else, I think we've all learned patience. That's right. Is, are you seeing it? No, we're, no we're, uh, we're seeing. We're just seeing the file folder. We don't see the um, actual presentation. I think you might have. Sure, yeah. almost. Almost. <laughs> we'll get there. Bingo! You see there it? Okay. Go. Great. There we go. Yeah. So, so as Sorry I said, for the delay. That's okay. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, we're going to see national level data so that we can we can really understand the trends. So we're going to start with uh, this slide shows labor force participation in percentages so that you can see the trends, how since 1985 our, our participation has gone up, then it went down some with, uh, with the recession, and then big crash towards the end of the screen with the pandemic. Now labor force participation is not the same as job loss. Um, we actually, women actually lost 4.5 million jobs during the pandemic, and men lost 3.7 million. Now, most folks, when they lose a job, they stay in the labor force. They keep looking for a job or hoping that they'll get the other one back in, in, during the pandemic. But 2.9 million left the workforce entirely in the first three months of the pandemic. They just said, they just stopped looking altogether. Now, 1 million of those folks did start looking again, but that still leaves us with 1.9 fewer women in the workforce now than we had at the beginning of 2020. 
Next slide, please. We're going to break it down by sex now. The men's numbers are on the left and the women are on the right. Now, you know that all the lines went way, way down during the pandemic, and most of them go back up again, except for the gray and orange lines on the right. Those lines represent Black and Hispanic women. Their labor force participation continues to decline even as others start to recover. Why? Well, it's the same problems that we always knew about. They're just compounded now. Unaffordable childcare, unsafe working conditions, low wages, in-person work requirements, and I would also submit that inconsistent unemployment insurance that isn't necessarily helping people recover from economic shocks may contribute as well. Next slide, please. So while we're at it, let's go ahead and look at wages. Um, two weeks ago, Pew Research gave us the, told us that women made 84% of what men earned last year. That is completely unchanged from 2019, which was before the pandemic. Um, and, it's, and that means that women have to work 42 extra work days in a year to make the same amount of money that men do. To compound that, the cost of childcare rose 2.2% last year. There's a big surprise. It's basic supply and demand. Um, all those schools closed, and so people look for more childcare, and so the demand drove up the cost. Even now, we're, we're hearing that, we're estimating that roughly 5 million women nationwide still are having trouble getting back to work due to childcare issues. Next slide, please. So I call this the why do we care slide. And to understand the answer to that question, we need to know what define gross domestic product, domestic product. That's something we hear a lot of. That's the total of all value that added that's created in an economy. That's the stuff we produce minus what it costs to produce it. And it is the most common indicator that we use to track the health of an economy. Now this slide kind of shows something kind of exciting. Higher workforce participation means higher GDP. It's a healthier economy. And if you bring that back from the US, to the US, when any metro area, including our own, when we get a 10% increase in women working, we get a 5% increase in overall average wages. So when more of our sisters participate in the economy, we all benefit, both collectively and individually. Next slide. Oh, oh actually, before going on, I do want to say the bad news about this, though. Um, last Friday's jobs report tells us that at the current pace, the labor market will not recover its pandemic losses until the summer of 2022, a year from now. And women's losses will take longer to recover, 28 months. That gets us to the fall of 2023. So we are now transitioning from a goods-driven pandemic-era economy in, in which the service industry, where so many women work, struggled. We are going to a new and unknown normal, and we're facing what is likely to be the second biggest economic reshuffling since World War II. Next slide, please. This is sobering stuff, I admit that. But our job at MCEDC is to mitigate all of this stuff in our community by assisting existing companies to create new high paying jobs for our residents and by attracting new companies that will do the same. There's lots of great information about that on our website as well as a COVID-19 business resources page. Again, thank you all for, uh, for inviting me to be here and I'm really excited now to hear from the rest of our panel. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I just want to let people know that we will answer questions at the end, so we're not ignoring questions. We're just going to wait until everybody's had a chance to talk, and then we'll um, we'll go ahead and look at the questions. So um, I'm going to invite Jennifer Arnais to speak next. Um, Jennifer, if you want to take it from here, please feel free. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Give me one second so I can do the technology on my own here. Hoping it'll my presentation will come up. There you go, it's there. Right. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Um, as Judy had mentioned, I'm from Department of Health and Human Services, a manager within Early Childhood Services, and I oversee the child care support services, which includes our child care community here in Montgomery County. Our division actually includes, in addition to child care support, early intervention um, for infants and toddlers who have special needs to receive services, 
as well as um, policy partnerships and public awareness that houses our commissions and councils that inform our county council and our county executive on early childhood related issues. So, there we go. So, um, yeah, childcare, um, you know, it's important to have a good understanding of what childcare is. Um, it is regulated. It's important to note that in Maryland, anytime a child is cared for outside their home, that program or home must be uh, registered or licensed by the state of Maryland. Choosing regulated childcare is a safer option for the children. Um, state regulations ensure that the health and safety of the children are preserved. The um, staff have uh, medical clearance, criminal background checks, as well as specific uh, qualifications in terms of classes that have been completed, um, degrees or certifications. It also ensures that there are an adequate number of adults to supervise the children. And it is, I should stress that in Maryland, we have one of the most well-known and well-recognized um, ratio system for caring for children. Um, so um, in addition to that, there are unannounced inspections that are done to the home by the state or the program, excuse me. And also we have um, a quality rating improvement uh, system that's called Maryland Excels that recognizes childcare for meeting benchmarks that go above and beyond licensing, such as higher teacher qualifications, having um, increased uh, activities in the classroom. Um, it could be for nutrition, it could be related to business practices, family engagement, um, or just a few of the, the, the examples. So there are really four different types of regulated childcare. I know that some families choose nannies and that is not regulated at all in the state of Maryland. A nanny is someone who goes into the home of the child to care for them. Um, for regulated childcare, we have family childcare. There are two types. There's a uh, large and uh, family childcare. Both are home-based and um, the difference between the two are the number of children that can be in the home. Uh, family child care has a maximum capacity of eight children, whereas a large family child care has a maximum capacity of 12 children. Obviously, with the 12 children, there are going to be more adults. There's an average of two to three, depending on the age of the children. Then we have what's more commonly referred to as a child care center. These are facilities that are um, housed in, in buildings, standalone, or in faith-based um, uh, churches and synagogues. And these programs um, have are usually mixed uh, mixed ages. Classrooms are divided by uh, the age group of the child. The number of adults are set by the number by the age of the children. The number of the children in the classroom. Um, they all three of these options are full day, full year. We also have um, public pre K, Head Start, and Early Head Start. Um, our public pre K and Head Start are run through our Montgomery County Public School System. They are income eligible for families. They run the um, academic year and their part day. And the early head start is for children birth to three, again, income eligible. There are three in the county that are, offer, that are um, offered by nonprofits. Um, there's one down county, mid county, and up county. And these um, you know, usually have a, a complement of child care for wraparound, so for before and after care. So during COVID, um, what we experienced in Montgomery County, when COVID first hit in March, um, all programs were closed, all childcare were closed. Um, and the state allowed for licensed childcare to volunteer to be open uh, to care for the children of essential personnel. So from March until June, we had roughly around 300 programs that were open in Montgomery County that cared strictly for the children of um, essential personnel who are responding to COVID. In June, programs reopened. Um, but in order to reopen, programs had to submit a verification of reopening. So even though they are licensed, they still had to go through a process to reopen. And that reopening process included a COVID response uh, plan what the program was going to do in the event that a positive case was um, established at the program, um, as well as the staff having to complete specific COVID-related training. Now, the related training is in addition to the other training that pro providers have to complete each year. 
they average between 12 and 24 hours of training that um, child care staff must complete. So during, um, once it reopened, um, we did have limited capacity in each of the programs in November, in, sorry, in March that was lifted. And um, we had programs returning to, to normal capacities following our child care regulations. However, today, what's happening today? So today, program, child care programs are still mandated mandated to wear masks, um, anyone two or older. So staff are wearing masks and the children are wearing masks. Uh, there is still recommendations of increased sanitizing and disinfecting, cohorting of groups where children are kept together with the same teachers, same children in the classrooms and limited guests and non-essential personnel. Um, I'm pleased to say that during COVID, um, you know, it was, we had, not everyone was open, but we really had less than 10% of our programs fully closed because of the additional mandates that were required. Staff in childcare are taking a lot of um, a lot of classes. They are ensuring the safety of the children. And so there's a constant reinforcement of how to care for children in this new safe environment. In addition to that, while this, the county does not regulate the child care program, that's the state jobs, uh, what we do is provide support. And so we do have a dedicated child care health consultant who is open to serving all the child care programs with any health and safety related questions from how to disinfect to how to reestablish protocols and procedures uh, when entering the program. We also provide technical assistance and training to support the programs with their um, this new world of you know of COVID and after COVID. So um, as women are going back into the workforce, um, I think it's important to know that at this time childcare is safe. It is a safe option. Uh, enrollment has been slow um, because many families are still you know readjusting to being back into the workforce. Um, but to, to choose childcare, it, it's a daunting thing. Some may have lost their childcare program. We did lose approximately 10% of our childcare programs from um, the economic impact of childcare. But what we're finding also right now, the, the, the programs that are reopened are not fully enrolled. So how do you go about finding childcare? Uh, we are very fortunate in the state of Maryland to have Locate Childcare. Locate Childcare is run by Maryland Family Network. It is a service, it is the only approved service from the state of Maryland that provides the counseling and the support to search for regulated child care. Uh, you can either do your own search on the on their website um, by setting up an account and then find, you know, filtering out some criteria about 10 different um, indicators that you're looking for, type of care, location, hours, and then you um, will generate a list of child care programs that meet your criteria. You can also speak to a trained counselor um, it's approximately a 20 minute conversation with a counselor where they ask many more in depth questions and can fine tune that child care selection for you. They also offer specialized services for families with children who have special needs. And so that again takes about 30 minutes to go through the different needs of your child, their abilities, and what is necessary in terms of hours, care, and things like that. So this service is a free service for families to look for child care, and I highly recommend making that your very first um, first task when looking for child care. The second part would be to verify compliance. It is public information to see all licensing compliance of child care. You simply go to www.checkccmd.org to find um, the compliance regulations that um, programs have either adhered to or failed. And third, um, I go back to the quality indicator, Maryland Sales, which is our quality rating improvement system. Uh, you can go onto um, MarylandExcels.org um, and find um, programs that are participating in this quality rating system that shows programs that go above and beyond licensing. And lastly, the child care supports. As Lynn had mentioned before, child care is one of the largest expenses for any household. The, um, it roughly takes, from the estimates, it's about 30% of your monthly expenditures. So there are three different supports that um, I can share with you today. The first one is the Maryland State Child Care Scholarship. It is, um, they support uh, families who are income eligible to help with the tuition um, of the cost of child care. You can simply go to moneyforchildcare.com to find out more information about eligibility. 
Montgomery County offers the Working Parents Assistance Program. We are the only jurisdiction that has a supplemental subsidy for childcare tuition. And so, whereas a family may qualify for the state, they may also qualify for our county um, subsidy program and get a differential. So, to help lower that cost of childcare. Um, because both are income eligible, Montgomery County, we do know is a much, it's more expensive to live in this jurisdiction. So our income eligibility is higher than the states. Whereas why I say that a family can meet both criteria and receive additional funding from the county to help with that, um, the tuition assistance. And in response to COVID, we did also, um, the council approved $5.6 million for a school age COVID relief voucher. So this specifically targets school age children, so kindergarten through sixth grade, sixth grade, excuse me, um, to help with the tuition assistance there as well. And you can go to a very long link, or you can just email school age grant at montgomerycountymd.gov for information about that. It is on our county's website. I believe Judith will follow up with some additional um, links after this session so that you'll have all this information. But that tuition assistance will go through August um, of this year. And again, that is going to be a little bit higher than our current subsidy programs to help all families with the tuition assistance costs. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, could I ask you quickly before we move on? Um, when you say income eligible, you were you were, had mentioned the other day that that's actually a pretty generous program. That I, you know, is, is people that are 130 percent. Correct. The, um, the state uses a federal poverty line and the county, because we do know, recognize the, the cost to live in this jurisdiction is higher than other jurisdictions. It is higher. It's about 350 percentile. And then the special um, COVID one for school age through, through August um, goes up to about 400 percentile. So okay. put it into numbers, um, concrete numbers. If you are a family of three, um, and you make under $89,000, $89, you will qualify for the state. Montgomery County, it's about 120. And then for the school age, we're looking at about 135,000, 140,000. Thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so um, next we're going to turn to Morgan Wortham uh, to discuss some strategies that businesses might consider um, to uh, make it easier for women to uh, re enter the workforce. So, Morgan, take it from here. Thank you. Good morning. So Ellen is also working the slides for me, so I appreciate it. I'll give her a second. And there we go. This one. So yes, uh, Morgan, we're gonna, I'm the managing director for the Maryland Women's Business Center. A little bit about us. We are a program of Rockville Economic Development, uh, which is a local based economic development corp for the city of Rockville. Uh, we are a certified SBA entrepreneurial development program, and most of our work is serving women entrepreneurs and small businesses in our region, which is Montgomery County and also Prince George's and Frederick County. We partner a, a lot um, with our uh, host organization to do uh, programs around larger economic development, including workforce. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies for um, small businesses and larger businesses around women in the workplace. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Ready um, as an organization to help re-enter our work. Next slide, please. So um, when it comes to businesses um, looking at women in the workplace post-COVID, really this is something that needs to be uh, strategic and also very intentional. Um, Diversity and inclusion are a big part of a lot of um, businesses. So coming up with strategies to help keep women um, in their employment and also as um, we'll hear a little bit later about when um, women are um, newly hired. So the first thing we know, of course, is workplace flexibility. We've learned quite a lot in this uh, COVID era about working remotely, working from home. Um, women obviously are juggling a lot, as Jennifer talked about, with the child care options. So allowing um, flexibility in the workplace um, versus um, kind of requiring the typical nine to five is very helpful. And we've learned it's very easy to be able to incorporate that in. Also, training and development opportunities. Um, 
you don't want to forget about the fact that um, in order to to sort of reintegrate in the workplace, you have to think about um, how people's jobs change, how how individuals will work differently, and part of that always is making sure that they have access to those training opportunities to um, stay up to date in their position, and also just general training and development for all staff so that they're you know able to be able to do the best that they can, and also recognition and promotion. Um, you want to make sure that uh, as you have women who are more flexible and who are not maybe in the office as much, that you're still considering them for promotion, for moving up in positions, and also just recognizing they work, the work they do and sort of building good morale. Next slide, please. So I'd like to take a little bit to talk about what we're doing at Ready and Maryland Women's Business Center since we are a small business ourselves. Um, so we have a staff under 10, and what uh, our CEO decided to do was have us develop sort of a plan for how we will reopen and go back into the office. Uh, we've been working um, completely remotely over the past 15, 16 months, and it's worked well, and so we are beginning to think about moving back in towards the end of summer, early fall. And of course, the first thing we thought about was prioritizing health and safety, uh, we have had our administrative assistant to put together a very nice um, return to work plan uh, that we will provide to all of our staff. It goes over everything from use of PPE to protocols for uh, sort of moving around in the office, how many individuals will be in the office at once. And I'll talk about that a little bit later here as I get down into some of our bullet points. Um, but we're, we're also looking at hand washing, at uh, mask wearing, all of those protocols. And those are things that each individual business is beginning to think about, and it's different in each place. Um, and obviously, um, discussing that with, with the staff is important and making sure it's communicated. We also have thought about rethinking the use of our office space and how it's designed. Um, we're making sure we have the proper plexiglass and other sort of protective barriers where they're needed, where um, maybe there's a little more interaction. And we're also thinking about how our individual offices are used um, and, and how we sort of move around in the office. And so we're making some changes to that so that we can accommodate sort of still having distance, but also having proper workspace. Uh, and so that's really something important to sort of think about of how you use your office. Uh, I'm a urban planner by trade, so thinking about space and its usage is something I'm quite used to. And, and so it's obviously something that you can talk with um, your local sort of government, too, about how they're thinking about it and getting some suggestions. And, of course, we're integrating more technology. We've begun to do that, obviously, by having laptops for everyone, being able to utilize Zoom. We're further thinking about that even further of how we use technology. One big thing is we've redesigned our um, conference room uh, so that we've got screens in there and so that we can sort of hold meetings remotely and it can kind of integrate in with the work that we do day to day when we're in the office also. So we're thinking about what additional pieces of technology we need in the workplace and also outside when we're working from home. Um, also, we're, we're changing how we interact with our clients and the public. Although we are an essential, an essential service, so we've been open throughout the entire pandemic, we've not been open to our clients in person or to the public. Uh, we've chose to do that all by phone and by Zoom, and we're even thinking that if we move into the office, we may not have access to the public as soon as we're in the office. And we'll begin to think about that, too, and think how many clients will we allow. Um, at this point, we won't allow young children in since they're not able to be vaccinated. So we're putting those guidelines in place so that way our staff feel safe and also so we have some good, good guidelines. And we'll also think about sort of how we'll um, kind of track who comes in the office with sort of log in, log out type of thing is something to think about, although we're not in the same age of contact tracing. Um, lastly, which I think is very important, is we're thinking about creating team building times. So not only will we think about how many people are in the office at once, but who's in the office and when. One of the best parts about being in the office is that time that you can have to uh, sort of talk amongst, even informally, um, build sort of that team building and just 
have that informal sort of growth of sort of your work. So we're going to intentionally correct, try to create those times where two to three people can interact with each other. And then so when you sort of have your work that's more individual, you can do that remotely, but intentionally create times where we can interact with each other. Um, and most of our staff uh, has already gotten vaccinated. We feel comfortable. So we're talking about that too, so that everyone feels comfortable interacting and it's a slow process too. Um, not everybody will feel um, comfortable being in person all at once, but we hope that by sort of intentionally thinking about how we interact with each other and making it sort of warm and inviting, that our staff will um, enjoy that and will begin to sort of integrate together in the office um, and in person. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit on a broader scale since the work that we do at Maryland Women's Business Center is primarily for um, small business development. We do our work through counseling and um, workshops and trainings for small businesses and wanted to kind of go over uh, the work that we're doing right now in order to, to help entrepreneurs uh, in the community and, and how it can help other businesses to think about it too. So most of our training that we've done in our counseling has been around helping women entrepreneurs to access the capital and the resources that they need, and also to help them um, prevent the hazards and transmission of COVID-19. Um, I encourage you guys not only to sort of um, attend our trainings, which are free and often very low cost, but also our resource partners, and I'll, I'll give some um, links at the end. Um, but there are a lot of resources via SBA and other entities at the state that can help small businesses to um, be successful still during the COVID era. I would say the most important pieces that we've seen that our small businesses in Montgomery County and our region need are really that resiliency um, to help them stay financially afloat and also how they're able to um, move some of their work uh, online to sort of e-commerce and marketing. Um, we've tried to pivot our work to provide access to that knowledge and also um, to technical assistants and specialists who can help them. So we're here to help not just women entrepreneurs, but all entrepreneurs in our region uh, to be successful with their small businesses. Um, last slide, please. So as we know, there's uh, tons of resources still available. Um, there are still some um, relief funds. Uh, I would suggest that not only can you um, look at the resources that we have at the Maryland Women's Business Center, but also our host organization, um, READY, um, and also with the Rockville Chamber and SBA. So I believe these links will be provided in the chat. Uh, I would say feel free to contact me or any of my staff um, for one-on-one -on -one counseling and also for our host, READY, uh, for work with larger businesses and looking at um, their workplace series that they're doing um, throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Great information. And I, I will reiterate everything that is being presented, including the links, we will send to a, in a follow-up email to everybody that's on our list for this uh, town hall. So uh, it'll take us a couple minutes to get everything compiled. So you can probably expect to see that next week. All right, we're going to turn now to uh, Zina Mad uh, with the uh, Montgomery County Commission for Women. Um, and Christine's gonna share some ideas for uh, women uh, who are re-entering the workplace and some strategies they might uh, employ. So, Kazine, turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, this has been so great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you. You know, it's really great to be with all of you. And we've got such a great group of panelists and it's just such an informative session so far. So I've, I've learned, you know, so much already. Um, so there's so many excellent resources available in our county that women can access when they're planning to enter the workforce or looking for a career change. Um, or re-entering the workforce. So it's there's so much out there. And since I'm here on behalf of the commission, I'll start with what the Commission for Women offers. Um, the commission assists women in all areas of their lives, but relevant to today's discussion, twice a year we offer a career series which consists of five free seminar set, uh, career seminars. Um, 
<clears throat> for those trying to change their careers or re-enter the workplace. Um, the career series focuses on resume writing, elevator speeches, using LinkedIn, interviewing skills, and wage negotiation. Um, and these are all really important tools to navigate today's job market. I mean, they're all really essential. Women, as women, often we sell ourselves short. Um, I know I do all the time, um, but, you know, it's what we have to teach, you know, women is that not to sell themselves, just be, it's, they sell themselves short by not selling themselves properly. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the commission receives calls from women saying that they've only worked for the PTA or they are, you know, helped with their kids sports or they've only done volunteer work for the religious organizations or local nonprofits. What we tell them is that all of these activities fundraising, event planning, community organizing. These are all transferable skills. You know, stay at home moms are often the best project managers because they are, they have to be organized. They have to be organized. They have to be able to multitask. They have to be able to manage people all the time. Um, so, and I'm sure this resonates with many of you here today. So, understanding how these skills can be transferred to the workplace is so important. Um, and equally important, and I think this is really an important part of it, is to be able to communicate that effectively to prospective employers. And that happens nowadays because it has to be via your resume, by your cover letter during the interview, um, and even how you present online. So in your LinkedIn profile is so important. Um, those are things that employers, you know, I know when I when I look to hire people, I'm looking, the first thing I look at is the LinkedIn profile um, and then uh, the resume and all of that, it counts. I mean, it makes a huge difference. Um, so the seminar series the commission does is designed to help with that, guiding women through the process of helping them find the, a career as opposed to just finding a job. So that is what um, it accomplishes. And these free, these are free seminars. And it, we just finished, wrapped up one in the, I think the last day was like the 1st of June, right around there. Um, but there's gonna be another one in the fall. And um, so they do them twice a year and we'll put the, Linked um, the link to the commission um, so website, which has information about this in the chat. I um, mean, you can also find other information about other programs the commission does year round. Um, so now, the other another important resource for those seeking employment in our county is WorkSource Montgomery. Um, it provides a wealth of information on jobs and how to prepare for them and the connections and events that help you obtain them. Um, and, and there's so much information on their website that you should really, if you know anyone, that that's something you should share with anyone looking for a job, or if you're looking for a job, or you're looking for a career change, definitely check it out. Um, so among the many services offered by WorkSource Montgomery include access to an assigned career advisor, which is really great, um, job listings, a calendar of job-related events, literacy and English language training information, and they also do the resume writing, interviewing tips, um, and they also have support staff to help you navigate the job center. So those are all resources that they have um, over there. <clears throat> One very successful initiative sponsored by the work it was sponsored by WorkSource Montgomery, um, but offered by Montgomery College has been their free um, four week biotech boot camp, which has been hugely successful. Um, and the goal was to quickly train workers for entry level bio uh, manufacturing jobs. So basically, you had a lot of displaced workers, um, hospitality workers and others who had job loss because of the pandemic, and they needed to find, you know, this allowed them to find a new career in the biotech field. Um, and it's an area that's experienced significant growth, as you can imagine, during the pandemic. The current uh, bootcamp session just started Monday, and I think it's the second pilot that they did. They did one earlier this year. Um, but there is a, they are planning other sessions and there's a, um, on Tuesday, June 15th, there's an information center, um, information ses sorry, session on, on this bootcamp via Zoom um, from 10 to 12. So, you know, it's open to the public. It's a great opportunity to learn about the program and see if it would be a good fit. Um, so I really encourage you to check that out um, if, you're, if you're interested. Um, also, Montgomery College offers their own biotech certificate program, which has always been available. Um, it's not the boot camp, which sort of compresses everything and does it very quickly, but it's there and that always gets rave reviews from both students and companies that are looking to hire. So 
um, that's another resource that the Montgomery College has. Um, in addition to, there's other online resources, and, and you, as you see, more and more, we're just doing all of this, it's online. I mean, even when you're applying for jobs, it's like everything is online. They're very rarely you get, you, you have to go through a few steps before you even get to see anyone. So, um, but there are some really great resources online. Um, so, one of them is the Montgomery Workforce Exchange. And again, we will add the chat, the link to the chat. but. On that website, this job seekers can register co to connect with employers and job opportunities, as well as register for upcoming employment fairs, recruitment, and hiring events. So that's a great resource. Um, another really um, nice tool that Montgomery College has, um, they, they've got quite a lot in the offering for this area, is a career coach. So it's a page on their website, it's called Career Coach, and basically helps you assess your skills and then give, it gives you education options that align with your career path. So if you're looking to go in a certain area, it sort of will provide you the guide. And it also has this really great resume builder online, resume builder, which, you know, people should, you know, you can access if you'd like to do that. Um, a few more. Um, so we have there's a career one stop org is sponsored by the labor, uh, Dep US Department of Labor. Um, and that also has a wealth of information that lets job seekers explore careers and find training and job uh, search resources online. Um, and obviously that you have the LinkedIn's and you have the indeed.coms and you have all of these um, other online um, portals where you can, you know, sort of upload your resume and, um, you know, look for jobs that might be and have them, you know, the flag them for you when they come in. Um, so, as there's a few upcoming events that I thought would be interest of interest to, you know, people here and most, I'm just going to focus on the ones in June because they're, they're constantly happening. But um, this month, Montgomery County Public Libraries are offering a free online workshops um, and one one on one sessions geared towards assisting job seekers and entrepreneurs throughout June. So all the workshops are free and I think everything that I've listed today is free. So you, you don't have to pay to access these. Um, but the um, jobs, the so it's all, all workshops are offered virtually still. I mean, that may change down the road, but um, so that's there. On Tuesday, uh, June 22nd, there's going to be a job fair at Westfield Mall in Montgomery, which is, would, you know, um, 10 to 2. So if you're looking, definitely put that on your calendar. Um, and on Wednesday, um, June 23rd, from 9 to 1, there's a, it's a, um online event again. It's a Montgomery County Employer Summit Information Workshop, which will look at capitalizing on the new hybrid workplace. So we talked a little bit about, you know, that model um, earlier. So this again is, you can register, there's a link, an Eventbrite link to link for the, to register for that. Um, and then you, going back to what I mentioned about WorkSource Montgomery, they have a calendar. I think every month they put out a calendar. Um, we can add the PDF to stuff we send out, the PDF calendar. Um, but in June, they have you know professional workshops and they're scheduled. You can pick a day that works for you on resume, cover um, letter writing, interviewing, salary negotiation, and, and many more things. So these are some of the tools that are worth looking at. and. Um, and sharing with your network, so sharing with other people who you feel like might be looking for jobs. And obviously, there's so many out there. Um, so, but we wanted to give you, hopefully, we thought this would be a good starting point to give you some resources to, to get started in your in the job search. Thank you, I, mean, I, I see that we are about out of time. Um, such great information shared by all of our um, panelists. I have put my email address in the chat. So I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance um, that we're not going to get to these questions because we're about out of time. But what I will commit to, if you will send the um, questions to my email, I will share them with this panel and we will get back with you with answers. Um, and Lynn, I see you've already um, offered to respond to one of the questions that came up. Um, I would say I see a question about uh, people who don't have internet access, and actually that's a really great uh, point. And I think the fact that our libraries are reopening uh, is one way that um, we will be able to provide access to computers to people who don't have that. Um, 
they have the Wi-Fi for one thing, but they also have access to computers. So I've actually even been thinking about asking whether the libraries can make like computer labs available to people that want to attend the virtual training that many of these uh, partners are offering. So that is something that is definitely um, an issue. So somebody's asking, and this is a question for Alan, and Alan, I just want to thank you so much for all of your support. Um, I think people were asking whether there's a chance to copy the chat before we close the. Um, yes. Okay. So we can keep that open. How long can we allow them to access that, Ellen? Uh, what five minutes? Sure. Very good. And then also, just I will send this. We'll compile all of these resources into one document and send it as a follow-up um, email to everybody that is invited to these town halls. So um, I'm not going to have enough time to adequately thank everybody that's been a part of this uh, panel discussion today. Oh, my goodness, you have brought so much good information and so many great resources to the table. I think that um, throughout my time with Montgomery County, one, one of the biggest frustrations has been knowing how many resources are out there and available for the business community and really being challenged to get that information out so people understand what what they can access and what's available. So I'm going to, um, I guess, Helen, should I stay on for the five minutes, do you think? Or should we just, what do you want to do? That would be great. Yes. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. So I will be here, um, the panelists, if you, want, if you wanted to stay or leave. I mean, if you're going to stay for a couple of minutes, maybe we could answer a couple of these questions. Okay. All right. Um, this one, Jennifer, is um, is the school age grant cover before and after care for working parents who want to send their kids to not full day MCPS summer school? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. excellent. How about that? <laughs> okay. And I will say there there are comments in here about um, the relationship between landlords and tenants, and the county is aware of the fact that this has been a real strain on small businesses. Um, it, it's um, a challenging issue uh, because there's, you know, the landlords also have pressures to meet obligations, and the tenants have pressures to, to get enough business to actually sustain. So we understand it. We did have a rental relief program that the Latino Economic Development Center ran on behalf of Montgomery County government. Um, and they are also going to be doing a seminar um, on demystifying the commercial lease contract on uh, June 15th. There's two sessions, one from 10 to 11.30 in English and one from 11.30 to 1 in Spanish. That will be followed by, by at least one, I'm, I'm hopeful, two legal clinics that will allow people to sit down with an attorney and talk about a specific issue. It's not intended to solve all of your legal problems, but it is uh, hopeful that we can provide some assistance. Um, I know that there was a question for Sylvia. She's left. I'm going to share that question with her. Um, and it, the person who asked that question, if you'll send me an email, I can get the answer to that and respond to you. Uh, there's a question on when infants and toddlers will go back into in-person daycare. So at this point, we're still doing virtual telehealth approach. Um, we have not received approval yet from um, the sponsoring agencies, which is MCPS and HHS. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so <laughs> so whatever information is shared here, like I said, the um, the this webinar, this town hall itself, has been recorded and will be posted on the Montgomery County Business Portal. Uh, Alan, if you're still here, if you could possibly uh, post the link to that in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, I, I will also see about creating a space on the portal where I can post um, some of this information. And the Business Portal has links to many of these things, and if, if they're not on there, anything that's appropriate for the Business Portal, I'll, I'll post on that. And then we will send this out um, in a in a consolidated form to everybody that you can then share in your networks um, as well with your colleagues and anyone else that might be interested. Okay, I think that that's 
all of the questions. So Judy, um, I, I just like to kind of just encourage people to think, uh, if you're looking for a job and your job, your what you previously did may not be what you want to do again, I would encourage you to think very, very broadly about what you might do next. And um, a classic example, uh, Tazine talked about the bio boot camps, and I bet you 95% of people here said, oh, I'm a bio, I could never do that. Well, you actually right. don't buy a degree to do it. It's super right. lucrative. It's the train and people who are who are good at systematic things, who've kept records before, who are good at um, under you know keeping the same um, series and sequence of events. These people are really good at lab tech work, and it's important. It's valuable. You you literally can save people's lives. It, it you know so there are just a lot of things that you think oh that would never be me, but it just might be um, the bio boot camp had a, had some very good success with people who were coming out of hospitality um, right. because they had the skills that were transferable. They could learn the lab stuff. It was the it was the organization and the recording of information and doing things accurately. They already had that. So think broadly, folks. Um, there there are a lot of opportunities out here. Um, Thank you, and, Lynn. I think uh, back to same point, you know, transferable skills. Think about your skills. Don't think about your job, right? So think about how those skills could be applied in other such ways. All right. Well, we have now gone over six minutes, and I want to thank everybody um, so much for your participation today. To the people that attended, thank you so much for being here. I hope you panelists can see all of the great um, comments. Thanking you in um, to Pat because. Um, your time is so valuable and your knowledge is so valuable. So thank you all for being here. And um, we will provide you with information on the next um, town hall uh, shortly. So keep in, uh, staying tuned for that. Okay. Thank you all so much. We're going to log off now. Um, best of luck with the reopening. Please stay safe um, and um, in, enjoy the new freedoms that we are enjoying right now. So. Get out, have fun, but do it in a safe way. Thank you. Thank you all.